and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Anjali Khamet. Anjali? We go now to Gaza, where at least five Palestinians have been killed in Israeli raids over the weekend. Three Palestinians, allegedly from the group Islamic Jihad, were killed in an air raid Sunday evening, and at least two others were shot dead by Israeli soldiers close to the northern border on Saturday. The attacks came as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned against renewed rocket fire from Gaza, citing as many as 20 rocket and mortar shells in the past week. No one in Israel was injured from these rounds. Also this weekend, Egypt said it would ban all humanitarian aid convoys to Gaza from traveling across Egypt on Friday, Egypt deported British lawmaker George Galloway, who'd led the Viva Palestina aid convoy to Gaza, and declared him persona non grata, citing clashes near the border with Egyptian security guards. Egypt's also being criticized for its decision to build an underground wall along the border with Gaza, which could further tighten the blockade on the 1.4 million Palestinians in Gaza who've been under siege for over two and a half years. Well, we go now back to a deadly assault in one Gazan neighborhood that took place just over a year ago. The Sammouni family, who live in an agricultural area in the Zaytun area of Gaza City, lost 29 members of their family in the attack. I visited the surviving members of the family in March. The orchard southeast of Gaza City came to an abrupt stop as we turned into Zaytun. We were headed to the site of one of the worst massacres during Israel's assault on Gaza. It was two months since Zaytun had been bombed, but the agricultural town was still eerily empty. Pools of sewage, uprooted farmland, destroyed chicken coops, broken pipes, homes leveled to the ground, and everywhere, mountains of rubble. A young man called Fadi Sammouni started giving us a tour of his neighborhood, pointing out where his relatives' homes had once stood. This was Fadi Sammouni's home. The house behind it belongs to Wael Esamuni, who is Ferris's son. This was Nafez Esamuni's house, and next to it, Sola Esamuni's house. Next to that comes the houses of Ziad Esamuni, Abu Khalil Esamuni, Jihad Esamuni, and Hamel Esamuni. And here is a three story building of Assad Esamuni, and the house of Azat, who is also Esamuni. Israel's assault on Zaytun was particularly deadly for the extended Sammouni family, who lost 29 members in air and ground operations early last January. 21 of them were killed while seeking refuge in a single building that Israeli troops had ordered them into the previous day. Eight others were killed in separate incidents. One of the survivors, Hamid Sammouni, recalled how it all began early on the morning of January 4th. When they first came, they arrived in Apache helicopters, and they came to this house first. I heard the sound on the roof and thought, maybe this is the resistance. They came in through the roof and entered while everyone was sleeping. The Israelis kicked the door open with their feet. Their weapons were drawn, and they told everyone to put their hands up. They began searching everything, and they blindfolded the people. Over the next few hours, families were rushing for cover from bombs and planes overhead. They went from house to house searching for safety. Many of the survivors we met told us that Israeli troops had ordered approximately 100 civilians into one house in particular, the home of Wa'ala Sammouni. These accounts are corroborated in several independent investigations, including the Goldstone Report. Nahil Abdullah Samouni, a 38-year-old farmer, explained how her family ended up in Wael's house after fleeing their own home. We escaped to our neighbor Abu Salah as Samouni's house, which was made of concrete. We went there, and within seconds, the bombing grew more intense and the shootings increased. The Israeli soldiers brought Rashad's family and Ibrahim's family to the house. We were about 60 people. Everyone was crying and terrified. Within seconds, the Israelis came to the door and told us to get out. They told the men to lift up their shirts and search their bodies. We were so terrified, we ran out into the street barefoot and sought refuge in Wael Asamuni's house. Fadi Samuni also found his way to Wael's house. At 5.30 in the morning, the bombing increased. The planes had been flying overhead throughout the night. My family and I wanted to escape from the house. As I was about to open the door, two bombs hit the house. We fled to Abu Salah's house. May God have mercy on him. Within five minutes, the third floor of his house caught fire. Three of us got out, my brother Ahmed, Saleh, and myself. 
we got out and ran toward Wa'il Asamuni's house, which is where the massacre happened. On his way, Fadi ran into a group of armed men he first mistook for Palestinian militants because of the way they were dressed. We came across six soldiers. We first thought they were resistance fighters and told them to get out of here. They raised their guns at us and told us to come closer. We approached them and they told us to kneel. They searched us thoroughly and began to ask who from here is Hamas, who is from Islamic Jihad. We told them we weren't part of any group and that we were all farmers and cab drivers, as you can see. For the rest of the day, dozens of family members remained crammed inside Wa'al Samuni's unfinished home with very little food or water. Outside, Israeli tanks roamed the streets. The bombing began early the next morning. Lamya Samuni's son Hamdi was among the first to be killed. He and a few others had gone outside to get firewood and help some of their relatives stuck in a nearby grove. There were some people among the trees in a house, a room in the trees. They started to say, save us, we want to join you. There were two stones they had to move. My son Hamdid and another young man, Mohammed Ibrahim al Samudi, started to move the stones when a bomb struck. It hit Mohammed and it hit Hamdid. And then another projectile struck Wa'ala Samuni's house, which was packed with nearly a hundred civilians. Nahil remembered the terror that followed as the house continued to be shelled. In seconds, another bomb came toward us from the north. We all fell to the ground and screamed in horror. We were terrified. The men stirred to say that whoever can move should get out. Before I could leave, my husband got injured. He started saying, my leg is gone. I said, what do you mean gone? I removed my veil, I tried to stop the bleeding, but he was very badly wounded and collapsed. In the chaos and clouds of dust and smoke that followed the bombings, those who were able to fled the house, assuming that only the dead had been left behind. But under the dead bodies and the rubble, number of people were still alive, among them Nahil's husband, Nafiza Samuni. I told my wife I've been injured, I've been injured. She said, what should I do? People want to get out of here. There were over a hundred people in the house. It was completely full. For him, the worst was yet to come. Some left and some, well, there were some 25 or 19 dead people around me and I spent the next four days looking at them. My husband spent four days among the dead. We started to scream and cry. I thought he was also martyred. I told everyone that my son and husband had been martyred. I swear that their heads had been cut off. Oh my God. Nafiz Samuni is still haunted by the days he spent trapped among the dead and dying bodies of his relatives, many of them old men, women, and young children. During this period, the Palestinian Red Crescent Society received 145 calls from Zaytun, but Israeli ground troops refused to allow ambulances to enter the area. If the ambulances had come from the beginning, this wouldn't have happened, but nobody was able to respond to us. Two and a half days later, when help was finally allowed to approach the area, medical workers arrived on foot and took Nafiz and a handful of other survivors to the hospital in donkey carts. Israeli forces still refused to allow ambulances to come right up to the house. Twenty-one dead bodies were left behind. It was only after the ceasefire was declared on January 18th that those who survived were able to return. They found most of their homes and a mosque had been demolished. Well, as Samuni's house was also bombed and had collapsed over the lifeless bodies inside. Hamid as Samuni recalled the smell of death as he tried to pull out their bodies. I was the first one on the scene where they had dropped the bomb. There was a small opening, a hole. I went inside and I found them all. They were under the rubble for 17 days. While we were trying to rescue them, their skin was coming off in our hands. We pulled out their decomposing bodies with our hands. All our calls for ambulances, to the Red Crescent, to this place and to that, it was all for nothing, all for nothing. Two months after the massacre, the horrors remained fresh in the minds of the survivors. We can't forget what happened. The girls cry every day. They remember their uncle and it's just like a dream. We woke up and found the Israelis above our heads and they took us out of our houses and the bombs were falling on us. We still can't believe what is happening to us. If you come to this place at 10 o'clock at night, you'll be afraid to come here because it has become a land of ghosts. 29 people martyred in this area. How are people supposed to come here to sleep, to eat, to drink? Even dogs live better than us.